Hello there, it's Dr. P. This video will describe the input capture unit on the Atmega 328P microcontroller. Our previous discussions related to the timer counter functionality of the microcontroller have been related to the output compare unit, which is capable of generating interrupts and or creating square waves at frequencies that we can configure in the timer counter configuration registers. In our discussions of timer counters, please remember the relationship between frequency and period. Frequency and period are inversely related. That is, frequency equals 1 over period. Period equals 1 over frequency. The units we use for frequency are hertz. The units we use for period are seconds. Frequency is a measure of how many cycles of a wave occur every second, which is the definition of the unit hertz. Period is a measure of the amount of time that elapses between cycles of a wave. Timer Counter 1 has a feature known as the Input Capture Unit. Note that this functionality is only available on Timer Counter 1 on the Atmega 328P microcontroller. The Input Capture Unit block diagram gives us a clue to its functionality. Based on a trigger condition, an ICP1 that's defined by the bit ICES, the value stored in TCNT1 at that moment will be stored in the ICR1 register. Because timer counter 1 is a 16-bit timer counter, both TCNT1 and ICR1 are 16-bit registers. In C, we can read to and write from these as if they were 16-bit registers. In reality, we know that there are high and low bytes for each register because they are actually made of 8-bit registers. This would be an important consideration for us if we want to read from and write to these registers in assembly, but is not terribly important in C. Note that the input capture unit is also capable of executing an interrupt on the trigger event. This is the timer counter 1 capture event interrupt. This is depicted by ICF1, the input capture flag, on the block diagram. When ICES has a value of 0, the input capture unit will trigger on a falling edge on pin ICP1. When ICES has a value of 1, the input capture unit will trigger on a rising edge on pin ICP1. On the Atmega 328P, ICP1 is PB0, pin 0 on port B. In this manner, the input capture unit can be used to calculate information about a square wave, the period of the wave, the high period of the wave, and the low period of the wave. When we know any two of these three things, we can calculate the third thing, as well as calculate the duty cycle of the wave. The simplest thing to measure with the input capture unit is the period of the wave. The period of a square wave is the amount of time that elapses between two subsequent rising edges or between two subsequent falling edges. While either edge can be used to calculate the wave period, for simplicity's sake, I'll refer to rising edges. By capturing the values in the timer counter at which subsequent rising edges occur and taking the difference, we can calculate the number of timer counter increments that occur between two rising edges. If we know how much time elapses between increments, we can calculate the wave period. The amount of time that occurs between timer counter increments is related to the I.O. clock frequency and the prescaler that is configured in TCCR1B. The amount of time per interval equals the prescaler divided by the I.O. clock frequency. Multiply the amount of time per interval times the number of intervals and you have calculated the period of the square wave. This is the simplest thing to calculate because the trigger condition remains constant, so the value in ICES does not need to change. Next, we can calculate the high period of a square wave. This relates to the amount of time that elapses between a rising edge and a subsequent falling edge. That is, we need to take the value recorded by the input capture unit when a rising edge occurs and subtract this from the value recorded when a subsequent falling edge occurs. The number of increments equals falling edge time minus rising edge time. Then we multiply that by the amount of time per increment to determine the high period. This is more complicated because the trigger condition has to change every time we record an edge. After we record a rising edge with ICES equal to 1, we then need to record a falling edge with ICES equal to 0 and then keep toggling between these two conditions.
We also need to remember to subtract rising edge from falling edge. If we do the opposite calculation, we will be calculating the low period, not the high period. If we know the total wave period and the high period, then we can subtract to calculate the low period. The low period is equal to the total wave period minus the high period. We can divide to determine the duty cycle of the square wave. The duty cycle is equal to the high period divided by the total wave period. Configuring timer counter 1 to use the input capture unit is not terribly difficult. We will very likely want to use timer counter 1 in normal mode, as there is no compelling reason not to count to max when using the input capture unit. Because we're collecting data from a square wave, we have no particular frequency in mind to use, and it makes no real sense to use CTC mode. So the waveform generation mode should typically be normal mode, unless there is some compelling reason to use a different modality, such as needing to use timer counter 1 for pulse width modulation with the output compare unit and then tagging along with the input capture unit. If you're not using the output compare unit, the COM bits in TCCR1A should be clear to disconnect the output compare pins. In TCCR1B, the input capture unit noise canceller should be activated by setting ICNC. The ICES bit will be either 0 or 1 depending on the desired trigger event. The prescaler will be selected based on your desired precision for the calculations of the wave period. The smaller the prescaler, the smaller the intervals of time that we can measure using the timer counter. However, this has the consequence of having less time elapse before the timer counter overflows. You should only use a small prescaler if you know you will have a fast wave period and need to be able to make calculations accordingly. The larger the prescaler, the larger the intervals of time we can measure, and the more time that can elapse before the timer counter overflows. However, if the wave period is faster than the increments of the timer counter, then we cannot measure the wave period. Something known as the Shannon-Nyquist sampling theorem tells us that our sampling rate should be at least twice as fast as the wave we need to measure. So we should have some anticipated knowledge of our expected input wave before we select a prescaler. Don't just randomly select a prescaler and hope it works. We will not be using force compares on timer counter 1, so we can ignore TCCR1C. In order to use the input capture interrupt, we will need to set the input capture interrupt enable bit in TIMSK1. The interrupt is where we can store the value recorded in the ICR1 register. Because timing is critical, particularly when we have an input wave with a fast period, we need to make sure we record the value in ICR1 as soon as the input capture interrupt is invoked. If we need to change our trigger condition, we need to make sure that happens immediately thereafter in order to be sure we can capture the next trigger event. If many interrupts can be invoked in rapid succession, we would need to carefully consider the effects this would have on our calculation of wave period. When using a device such as the ultrasonic sensor, this will not be an issue. The high period of the ultrasonic sensor is not fast enough to warrant concern, as we have a fast I.O. clock on our microcontroller that will ensure our calculations can easily take place between subsequent input capture unit trigger events. The ultrasonic sensor works with the microcontroller using the input capture unit. First, send a high pulse of duration 10 microseconds to the ultrasonic sensor trigger pin using any output pin on the microcontroller. The ultrasonic sensor will emit an ultrasonic sound wave and wait for that wave to be returned to the unit. When this happens, the sensor will emit a square wave on the echo pin with a high period proportional to the amount of time it takes for the sound wave to return, which is proportional to the distance of the nearest obstacle. Velocity equals distance divided by time, and the speed of sound in air is constant if temperature doesn't change, which is a reasonable assumption for us to make in most lab conditions. Rearranging variables, distance equals the amount of time the echo pin returns a high signal times the speed of sound divided by 2. The divided by 2 is due to the round trip the sound wave makes from the ultrasonic sensor to the obstacle and back. The speed of sound in air is nominally 340 meters per second at room temperature. Note that this value is not valid at hotter or colder temperatures. The amount of time that the signal is high will of course be related to the IO clock frequency and the prescaler, 
as previously described. Just a note on ultrasonic sensors. If you ever want to buy one for yourself, make sure that you purchase one with an onboard oscillator. I've used ultrasonic sensors without them, and they're extremely unreliable. I basically had to throw them out. The HCSR04 is a good device. Buy it from a reputable vendor, such as SparkFun or Jamco, to make sure it comes with the oscillator. Because there is only one input capture pin, ICP1, if you want to use multiple ultrasonic sensors, you will have to use an external multiplexer to mux the multiple echo pins into the single ICP1 pin. For two ultrasonic sensors, this will require one microcontroller output pin to act as a control bit on the mux. Up to four ultrasonic sensors and you'll need two microcontroller output pins to act as mux control bits. I'll leave it up to you to determine how to switch between sensors. As always, the microcontroller datasheet has more information about the timer counters and input capture unit. Refer to that if you're interested in exploring more. The datasheet for the ultrasonic sensor is another resource if you want more information about that piece of hardware. Happy coding! Until next time, stay well.